Hello, friends. Welcome to our latest installment of Unsolved National Park Disappearances. In this episode, we'll be focusing on Canadian national parks and wilderness areas. Now, Canada's national parks represent the diversity of natural regions and landscapes in Canada and protect approximately 328,198 square kilometers of Canada's lands. And with this abundance of wilderness comes lots of missing persons cases. What's most disturbing, however, is that these numbers are ever increasing and the circumstances behind these disappearances often can't be explained. Today we'll discuss 10 unsolved disappearances from Canada's national parks and wilderness areas. Number 10, Ali Nadiri. 52-year-old Ali Nadiri was last seen on Sunday, August 23, 2020, at the foot of Eagle Mountain, also known as Eagle Ridge, in the Indian Arm Provincial Park near Coquitlam, British Columbia, Canada. Ali is described as a Persian man having a dark complexion with black salt and pepper hair that curled over his ears and brown eyes. He's 5 foot 10 inches tall and weighs 176 pounds. He was wearing dark shorts and a dark hiking jacket and carrying hiking poles with him. Ali was reported missing at around 9 p.m. on August 23rd. Police soon found Ollie's vehicle near the 2500 block of Diamond Crescent in Coquitlam. Trail camera video also places him on the mountain the day he disappeared. 183 trained volunteers spent a combined total of 2,400 hours searching for Ollie using GPS, drones, helicopters, and canines. Police said the teams covered 48,000 square meters of the mountainous trail, but that they were entering riskier terrain with less certainty that they were looking in the right direction. After seven days, the field search was suspended, awaiting new tips or evidence. Investigators have searched Alley's apartment and vehicle, and his family and friends have been spoken to, with nothing out of the ordinary turning up. He had regularly gone up on the mountain with limited supplies and knew the area well. Did he fall and become injured? Was he attacked by an animal, or was it something more sinister? Now, there has been no evidence of foul play, and no hiking gear or other belongings have been found. Number 9, Stephanie Stewart. 70-year-old Stephanie Stewart disappeared on August 26, 2006, from Athabasca Fire Lookout in Hinton, Alberta, Canada. Stephanie had worked for 18 years for the Alberta Natural Resources Group. She also spent her summers for 13 years at the Athabasca Lookout, which is 25 miles east of Hinton, or 145 kilometers north of Edmonton, and located on a high ridge in the northwest area of the province. Stephanie was healthy and adventurous despite being 70. When she missed her usual call-in first thing on the morning of August 26, it was obvious something was terribly wrong. Many phone calls were made to Stephanie's phone in the lookout, and whoever answered hung up repeatedly. The phone was unplugged afterwards. Stephanie's supervisor went to the lookout immediately. When the supervisor arrived, there was a pot of water left boiling on the stove, and her truck was still parked outside. The supervisor also reported a significant amount of blood at the scene. Some items were also missing from her cabin. Two pillows with blue cases, a burgundy bed sheet, a Navajo pattern duvet, and a gold watch. The search for Stephanie was one of the largest coordinated in the province. Forensic evidence and other information gathered led the RCMP to rule out that Stephanie was attacked by an animal, died accidentally, or suffered a medical event. She had spoken with a family member the night before her disappearance without setting off any alarms. The police concluded that she must have been taken by someone. Whether she has passed away is unknown. Because of the boiling water, it is believed she received a visitor that morning or someone had spent the night with Stephanie, whether she wanted their company or not, and the phone calls had interrupted the perpetrator. Stephanie's friend, Robin Slater, said, Her perfect place was the lookout. She was always a welcoming person and enjoyed visitors. On August 23, 2018, a new search was launched for human remains. Authorities would not say what prompted the new search, but the case remains unsolved. Her body and the items missing from the cabin have still not been found. 
Number 8. Marty Legere 30-year-old Marty Legere disappeared on May 29, 2014 from Spider Lake in Nova Scotia, Canada. Marty was from Halifax, Nova Scotia. He went for a routine bike ride on a popular trail at Spider Lake on May 29. There's nothing extremely remote about the area. The trailhead is even in a residential area. Later that day, the RCMP received the call that he was missing at 8.40 p.m. after he failed to show up back at home in Halifax at 4 p.m. His vehicle was found parked at the end of Spider Lake Road near the trailhead. The RCMP launched a search that included nearly 500 people. Volunteers, dogs, and helicopters searched nearly 60 square miles. The search for Marty Legere was one of the largest in Canadian history. 250 members of the military also joined the search. RCMP Captain Scott McRae said some rescue workers suffered injuries due to the difficult terrain. Still, nothing was found. In October 2016, human remains were found not far from the Spider Lake trailhead, but they turned out to be those of a different missing person, 50-year-old Cordell Stephen Ware of Dartmouth, who had left his home in 2013 with no money, ID, tools, or equipment, and was said to have been in a poor state of mind when leaving. Marty Legere remains missing, and there have been no further updates. Number 7. Christina Kaleka 20-year-old Christina Kaleka disappeared on Monday, August 6, 2007 from Rainbow Falls Provincial Park in Ontario, Canada. The park is located on Highway 17, which is also known as the Trans-Canada Highway, between Schreiber and Rossport on the north shore of Lake Superior. Christina was with her female cousin and two male friends from a Christian youth group called Youth for Christ based in Toronto. They were all inexperienced in the wilderness. Friends and family described Christina as a mature religious woman. The group arrived at the park around noon on Sunday, August 5th to set up their camp and decided to take a nap. They didn't wake up until 10.30 p.m. Afterwards, they enjoyed food and talked until they finally went back to sleep. By 6.30 a.m. on Monday, August 6th, Christina and Eddie McGew, one of the friends from her church group, were wide awake. They went off for a run together, but later she split off from Eddie, running on the park trails while Eddie stuck to the road. At about 7.30 a.m., Eddie returned to camp, but there was no sign of Christina. The friends frantically searched before reporting her missing to the authorities after about seven hours of their own efforts. Christina was last seen wearing a blue hoodie sweatshirt, a maroon and purple striped shirt, black pants, and white running shoes. The OPP, or Ontario Provincial Police, Northwest Region Emergency Response Team used four K-9 teams, three helicopter search groups, two fixed-wing aircraft, and a float plane to try and find Christina. Around 100 police officers and specially trained civilian volunteers searched the area for 17 days. The OPP believed that Christina had been killed by a bear, but there was no evidence of blood, clothing, or remains found. They were convinced that there was no foul play. Elizabeth Rutledge, Christina's mother, believed she was abducted or worse. Christina's family has financed private searches, paid for both out of their own pockets and with the help from the Find Christina Kaleka Foundation. Volunteer groups and cadaver dogs have also searched with no luck. A year later, in June 2008, Officers searched for a week with a high-angle team scaling cliff sides. The family also put together a team of American and Canadian volunteers and dogs which searched the park on June 13, 2008, but again with no result. Number 6. Sylvia Apps 69-year-old Sylvia Apps left on July 8, 2014 for a five-day solo hike in Vancouver Island's Strathcona Park in British Columbia, Canada. She started in the Paradise Meadows area of Mount Washington and was expected back on July 13th, but she was never heard from again. Strathcona Provincial Park is full of rugged mountain wilderness. It is the oldest provincial park in British Columbia, the largest one located on Vancouver Island, and was created over 100 years ago in 1911. Comox Valley Ground Search and Rescue began searching around Castle Crag Mountain with helicopter support but ended the official search after one week. Search and rescue teams then focused on targeted searches to ensure the most likely areas were double-checked. Sylvia's backpack was found in one location, her walking sticks and camera in another, 
and her name in the logbook on one of the peaks. Paul Berry, president of the Comox Valley Ground Search and Rescue, said it was the first time they had failed to find someone despite finding all of their belongings. He believes Sylvia likely suffered a medical emergency, such as a heat stroke, and was unable to think clearly while awaiting rescue. Sylvia remains missing, and there have been no further updates. Number 5. Jordan Naderer 25-year-old Jordan Naderer was reported missing on October 13, 2020, from E.C. Manning Provincial Park, usually referred to as Manning Park, in British Columbia, Canada, about 200 kilometers east of Vancouver. Jordan was Memorial University engineering alumni and recent graduate of the University of British Columbia. It's believed he set out for a solo hike on Frosty Mountain Trail in the park, but that is unable to be confirmed. He was last seen leaving his downtown Vancouver apartment in Seymour and Nelson Streets, wearing black pants and white running shoes and carrying a large olive green backpack at around 7 a.m. on October 10, 2020. Jordan is described as 5 feet 10 inches tall with a slim build and has short brown hair. When he didn't show up for Thanksgiving dinner with friends two days later on October 13th, the search began. His black 2016 Honda Civic was found in the Lightning Lake day use area of the park at the Frosty Mountain Trailhead. His bank records showed that he had bought a cup of coffee at the Manning Park Resort, giving the family verification as to where he was. Jordan's parents flew to Vancouver from their home in St. John's to help in the search. For five days, search and rescue teams from several parts of British Columbia combed the area by air and on foot. Several volunteers also helped out. However, on October 17th, the authorities decided to suspend the search, stating they had exhausted all avenues. This case has been surrounded by controversy, with the Canadian Prime Minister becoming involved after many people believe the search was called off too early. Investigators believe Jordan was on a hiking trip that went poorly. The family launched its own private search, hired a drone company, and paid for a helicopter. They also appealed to Vancouver Police Department to reactivate the search as soon as possible and get the thermal imaging helicopters and drones and dogs involved. Early in the initial search, crews found a bag that authorities didn't think belonged to Jordan. But then, on October 18th, Jordan's mother, Josie, identified the contents of the bag as her son's, which included a hat and a pair of Oakley sunglasses. Pieces of down material used in pillows and jackets were also found in the park. It was similar material Jordan used to make crafts and had been found at his apartment, according to his father, Greg Natterer, who also submitted that off-trail footprints had been found south of Frosty Peak in an area that wasn't well searched. Greg asked the RCMP to search the area east of Frosty Peak based on new clues found by a private tracker. Search and rescue teams from three different districts near Vancouver resumed the search on October 22nd, but after nearly a month, no sign of Jordan was found. Jordan remains missing, and there have been no further updates. Number 4. Bart Schleyer 49-year-old Bart Schleyer is thought to have disappeared on September 14, 2004 from Reed Lakes, Yukon Territory, Canada. Bart was a famous and experienced outdoorsman who loved everything about the wilderness. He was a trained scientist, an avid hunter, and spent months at a time in the great outdoors. His dad was a physician who loved hunting and introduced him to the lifestyle early on. Bart's sister, Claudia Downey, said this of her brother. He didn't just like them, animals. He wanted to know everything about them, study where they lived and how they lived. My dad took Bart with him on safari to Mozambique when he was 10 years old. He had a chance to witness an incredible variety of animals that he could otherwise only read about. When he finally got a chance to hunt, he was drawn even closer. Hunting seemed to give purpose to his studies. Bart focused his education on wildlife biology and transferred to Montana State University and received his master's degree from there in 1979. Professor Don Collins, who taught an undergraduate class called Man in the Environment for more than 20 years, said, out of the 42,000 students who took that class, Bart was a standout. He was knowledgeable in everything wild, from animals and birds to flowers, trees, and shrubs. 
Bart spent a great deal of time alone in the mountains while working on his thesis, The Activity Patterns of Grizzly Bears in Yellowstone. It was as if he prepared his entire life to do this. He was superbly suited for the demands of the job. Bart organized the rest of his life so that he could spend as much time as possible out in the field. He used the traditional bow and arrows he fashioned himself. Needless to say, Bart felt right at home in the depths of the Canadian wilderness when he traveled there in 2004. And yet, his last contact was when a chartered float plane left him at the larger of the Reed Lakes in Canada's Yukon Territory on September 14. When his plane returned to pick him up two weeks later, Bart was gone. The man who could be described as a survival expert was nowhere to be found. Which was odd because he was well prepared and had at least two weeks worth of food in tow as well as a tent and an inflatable boat. He was officially reported missing on September 30th and the RCMP launched a comprehensive search but found nothing. According to the RCMP, Bart had lunch or supper in camp since there was food found that was still in the crate. He had used his boat and paddled it down the lake from camp. It was found around a half a mile out. Mounties thought that Bart might have hiked to the highway and with deteriorating weather called it a day. Dib Williams, a friend of Bart's in Whitehorse, was dissatisfied with the RCMP's efforts and got his pilot friend Wayne Curry to fly them to the camp. The friends found that his tent had been knocked down, either by wind or animals, but his equipment was still there. They searched the area around the tent and found his backpack, bear spray, a knife, and a VHF radio. Deb and Wayne got increasingly concerned as they didn't buy the story that Bart would have hiked out when he left such key equipment behind. On the second day of their search, they found his bow near the inflatable boat. About 60 yards back in the woods from the boat, the bow and arrows and a handmade buckskin quiver were found leaning up against a tree next to a dry bag full of gear. This was flat ground, which was next to a thicket of black spruce and willows. An experienced moose hunter would say it looked like the type of place an archer might set up if moose calling. A little further on, they found a camouflaged face mask with blood and hair on it. At this point, they called the RCMP again. On October 3, the Mounties, Yukon Conservation Officers, and even civilian volunteers flew back to the area to begin a grid search. They only found bear and wolf tracks initially, but then a baseball cap was spotted, and then camouflage pants, a camera, part of a skull, and just a few small bones were all located. These items were all 60 meters or so from the bow and the spruce tree. Dental records matching the partial skull confirmed the remains did, in fact, belong to Bart. Most of his body was not recovered, and since there was grizzly excrement in the area, it fueled speculation that Bart had been unexpectedly killed and eaten by a bear. However, most of Bart's clothes were never found. Searchers were skeptical that a bear was at fault. First, there was no sign of a death struggle, no vegetation or ground disturbed. The remains were found in a little patch of sparse spruce lying on the moss, and if a bear killed them, this would be unusual as they usually bury their kills in a cache, but there was no cache found in the area. Almost everyone who knew Bart believed he was simply too good a woodsman and stayed too alert while in the forest to have a bear surprise him. And if one had, it's even harder to imagine the animal killing him without leaving signs of a struggle on a site covered with soft, easily disturbed moss. The Vancouver pathologist who examined Bart's remains also found no tooth punctures in his skull and no scratch marks. The plastic container that held his food was left undisturbed, and bear experts said that if a grizzly had killed Bart, it is likely the same bear would have found his camp and rummaged through everything. Most people agree that the circumstances of Bart's disappearance are very strange, even if they disagree about the cause. Brigitte Parker, a spokeswoman for the Mounties and Whitehorse, said that Bart's case remains open, but the organization leans toward the idea that he was attacked and killed by a bear. There's no foul play suspected, she said. Everything at the scene suggested a bear attack and did not suggest foul play. Bart's exact cause of death remains unknown. Number 3. Gordon Segu 50-year-old Gordon Segu disappeared on August 14, 2016 from Baby Monday Peak in the Cheam Range, which is located in the Fraser Valley region of the lower mainland of British Columbia near the city of Chilliwack. 
Gordon was hiking to Baby Monday Peak with two friends on Sunday, August 14, 2016. He wanted to explore a different peak, so he went ahead of the group and disappeared. His friends said he was physically and mentally strong. He was a long-distance runner and had completed several marathons. His friends and family also said he was an experienced hiker who knew the area well. Search and rescue crews were first called out on the night of August 14th to look for Gordon in the Chilliwack River Valley. He was last seen near Baby Monday Peak. A large search was organized with ground teams, helicopters, drones, and police dogs. The crews thoroughly searched the area, but did not find a trace of Gordon. His family had returned to the mountain daily, assisting in the searches. North Shore Search and Rescue even brought in a thermal imaging camera. After a week, on August 21, Chilliwack Search and Rescue recommended to the RCMP that the search be called off. They said, after consulting with search and rescue managers from Kent Harrison SAR, Coquitlam SAR, and North Shore Rescue, the management team from Chilliwack SAR reviewed all aspects of the search operation on Sunday. A report was presented to the Chilliwack RCMP recommending the suspension of the search. Members of Gordon's family thanked the various search and rescue teams for their courageous and tireless efforts in a statement. However, they also vowed to continue the search privately via other channels. Sagu's niece, Manpreet Gill, said, This has been one of the most agonizing and challenging times our family has ever gone through. Nothing has been harder than returning home each day without him. He is strong, determined, resilient. There isn't a powerful enough word to describe my uncle. Gordon remains missing, and there have been no further updates. Number two and one, Jonathan Jeté and Rachel Bagnall. 34-year-old Jonathan Jeté and 24-year-old Rachel Bagnall were last seen on September 4, 2010. They disappeared from the Spetch Creek Forest Service Road that leads to Valentine Lake in British Columbia, Canada. Rachel was studying to become a physician and was planning a trip to Columbia where she would be working for a year in underprivileged communities. She had been hiking since the age of five. Jonathan worked for the government in Quebec and was an avid climber. The couple were planning to enjoy their last few days together by hiking and visiting Valentine Lake near Pemberton before Rachel was to move abroad. According to bank records, the couple visited Tim Hortons in Squamish on September 4th where they purchased a coffee and a hot chocolate at 7.42 a.m. From there, they traveled through Whistler, Pemberton, and towards Birkin before parking on the Spetch Creek Forest Service Road and presumably taking the trail that would lead them to Valentine Lake about a five-hour hike. It was Rachel's sister, Elizabeth, who notified authorities that something was amiss on September 8th when the couple hadn't returned to Vancouver as expected on the 6th. Jonathan's four-door Toyota Echo was found by authorities on the service road almost immediately. They recovered the empty cups from Tim Horton's coffee shop from the car, as well as a cell phone. The records showed that Jonathan hadn't made any calls after September 3rd. Nothing else noteworthy was found in the area around the vehicle. A full search and rescue operation was launched. The RCMP climbing team was sent to rappel down and search. Rescue dogs and cadaver dogs were brought in. No trace of the couple was found. The official search was called off in October, more than a month after the couple were first reported missing. Police were provided with a tip that a witness saw smoke in the area above Peg Creek during the days that the couple would have been camping. Unfortunately, nothing was discovered. A couple months later, in December of 2010, Another witness in Mount Curry reported some unusual bird activity. After the long wait for the snow to melt, police met the witness on the ground and mapped out the area where the bird activity had been observed. It was then searched with multiple teams, all coming up empty yet again. Police have looked through Jonathan and Rachel's homes, Facebook accounts, cell phone records, and personal computers, as well as their bank accounts and credit cards, and found nothing. Although a few new pieces of evidence have surfaced, like some nail clippers which were DNA tested and the discovery of an old fire pit near the Peg Creek area, these leads have proven to be dead ends. 
So there are 10 unsolved disappearances from Canada's national parks and wilderness. If you have any information on any of these cases we've discussed today, please call the National Park Investigative Service branch at 888-653-0009 or Crime Stoppers at 800-222-8477. As always, we ask that you please be kind in the comments below and treat these cases with respect. As we continue this series, we'll keep you updated on these cases if updates become available. If you have a case you would like to see featured in this series, please email us at nationalparkmysteriesyt at gmail.com. Until we meet again, take care of yourselves and each other. I'm Steve Stockton, and I'll talk to you next time.